Evening all, and we're back for episode five of Behind the Tapes uh, after an action-packed week of harness racing action and an action-packed day for you, Matty, commentating 14 heats at the trials today uh, after the late call-up. Yeah, late call-ups, right, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, um, an hour out before the first heat. They couldn't quite fly Mark Mack over from quarantine in Sydney, and uh, Matt Cross was at Rangura Call and Jump Outs there, so uh, the poor people at Ashburton had to put up with my voice for the day, so... Uh, performances. Princess Tiffany, the star of them, 257.0 for the 2,400 metre mobile. She was ultra impressive. Stable made enhanced for calm was really good. He ran down Winterfell on the straight. I thought that was a big performance. And a maiden pacer by the name of John James Preston from the Jessica Young Grant stable was another one that caught the eye. So uh, good to be out there today and see some really nice horse flesh in action. But And obviously uh, we were unable to get that meeting with Ian McKelvey today um, due to Todd Muller resigning as uh, as national leader this morning. So he's had to rush away and, and was at, wasn't was able to be at Ashburton, but Maddie's uh, on for that and been handling that. So he'll be able to bring you some more information uh, when that meeting is going to happen. And hopefully we can get that before the uh, election date in the next few weeks and, and speak to Ian and, and we'll head down to Ashburton and have a chat to him about all things racing. But hey, Maddie, there was some really nice horses back on the track and there's going to be some even nicer horses well not even nicer horses but more nice horses coming over the coming back to racing over the uh, next few weeks but on friday night spirit of st louis a really good win and he's probably surprised me a bit um i knew he was good and his win the week before was good but i didn't think he could do that to that field uh when maddie williamson pulled him out at the 800 and and boomed around into the park spot. He just dropped the bit really nicely. And when he asked him to go again, it was there. And it was a great win. And, and it just surprised me. And I'm sure there was a few more out there that were surprised. Um, were you as surprised as I was? Yeah, I probably was. Probably more for the fact that he burnt to get around them and showed a real turn of foot to get to park and then still had the audacity to run away from them uh, halfway down the straight. Look, he's a serious customer. Uh, we knew that though, like he, he's always been competitive in really good races. The next challenge for him is taking that next step up into the next grade and, and you know, going on against those fringe open class horses and, and, and the open class horses and he's going to get those opportunities in the coming months. Uh, typical Graham Anderson horse, you know, you can back them with a bit of confidence because they don't go to the races unless they are capable of winning and thought it was a good drive by Matty. He got into the race at the right time and knew the horsepower that he had in front of him. So they're in for a good time with him. Um, he's certainly developing into a really, really nice horse and just adds another piece to the puzzle when it comes to uh, some of the feature racing we've got ahead. Yeah, looking forward to seeing how he progresses over the next uh, few weeks and, and where he heads to in November, uh, certainly a good race there, probably the junior free for all, a race like that for him where he's going to be a really good chance. Um, another one that resumed, Krug, uh, just an arrogant win, boomed out of the gate, easy lead and just was able to dictate Blair Orange and just turned it into a sprint home really and cleared away to win by six or seven lengths and um, he's really buffed up over the break. I was talking to Crandall Getty and he just said, you know, while everyone was disappointed to miss those two-year-old features, and he would have been in them and, and you know he would have been in the dog fight while well, everyone was disappointed to miss them it's probably done crew and it would have done a few others the world of good um that spell away he's just come back and he's just bogged up he's got a big neck on him and he just looks like a, a serious pacer now um so he's he's on the i think they're planning to send him to auckland there's a few you know a few races up there for him um harness million races and stuff like that but super win there maddie yeah, he was. Uh, well, look, we expected him to win. He was the class act of that field and he, he duly delivered. Uh, I thought the only horse that might have got close to him was held to ransom. Um, probably not who kind of race when left park, but he was really good crew. Um, but he's going to have to be even better in the coming weeks. But, see, you know, there, there's a big crop of uh, rivals coming his way. We know he's up to handling them. But I would say, as I saw a horse in his age category go around today at Ashburton called Pride in Place. Uh, it is out of Maiden Splendour by Better's Delight. It was very, very impressive. 157.4 or something like that. Uh, so that that particular age group is going to be really, really strong when they come back in the spring. And looking forward to seeing, A, whether Krug's still right up the top of the pecking order where he was when we went into break to, uh, into lockdown. 
So uh, he certainly started on the right foot on Friday night, Andrew, that's for sure. Yeah, some exciting uh, three-year-old pacing races coming up in the near future. And even more exciting is um, some of the open class trotting ranks, Majestic Man. He returned the other day and um, just, he was an easy winner at Addington. Uh, Brad hardly moved on him and oh, he's just a nice horse. And, and he's probably one of those leading trotters that we've got. There's going to be a serious chance in races like the Dominion and the Trotting Free for all this coming November, Matty. Yeah, definitely. Look, um, he's always been a high-speed horse, majestic man. Uh, look, I think he might be with a bit of age on his side, developing a bit of toughness as well, which will take him a long way, particularly when you get to races like the Dominion and the Row Cup and those sort of things. We know he goes the Auckland way around uh, based on his efforts at the Inter Dominion. So he was tradesman-like, I guess you could say, on Friday night. You expected him to win and he delivered. What I would say, Fitzy, if there's been a big mover in the trotting ranks, Midnight Dash is a horse that I think has got a big future and is going to pick up a big race at some point. That was a really, really good run considering the step up and grade it was for it. Taking ground off Majestic Man, I know he was switching off, but uh, the hopes have got a very, very serious trotter on their hands there and uh, Midnight Dash is only going to get better with time on his side as well. So keeping in the trotter's theme, uh, we headed to Sunday and of course there was a much anticipated two-year-old trot and uh, while the favourites probably didn't fight out the finish like we thought they would there was a very good performance from a very smart horse in time up the hill trained by the ward family ken barron back in the bikes so a bit like getting the old firm back together um, ken's driven for the stable a lot uh ken was the driver of the dam of time up the hill majestic time she ran second from memory to one over the moon at the ashburton harness jewels as a two-year-old I remember it well because I backed her at $26 and she hit the front at the top of the straight and I thought she was home and then chewing gum down the outside fence game Davy Butt I think on one over the moon and uh, threw me out. So uh, look, nice to see them with a uh, with a really another nice, really, tr sorry, I'll spit that out again, a really nice trotter again and one out of their own breed. Um, I will say this, Andrew, and I put it on Twitter after the race, if Manny Williamson could have let Love and the Port go, uh, I think it would have been a very different result. Um, big performance. It's got a serious motor, that horse. Uh, it's only going to get better with time. But uh, those two-year-old ranks are full of talent. Euro Cash was a bit disappointing. Lorena Del Sur obviously galloped uh, coming up to the winning post for the lap left to run. But uh, there's, a, there's a big horde of them about to come out again soon. We've got a few going around on Friday night at Addington. So looking forward to seeing what unfolds in those uh, two-year-old trotting ranks. But uh, time up the hill at this point to me, is as good as any we've seen, as is Love in the Port. So it's going to be interesting times ahead. Yeah, we action-packed two-year-old trotting race. Um, Euro Cash pulled up. Uh, I think he's got a wee infection there and fighting something they, I saw on the stewards' report. And um, he was pretty disappointing for punters. But, uh, yeah, I think they were they knew Love in the Port were good. And, and from the words that they were talking about, and they knew he was good. They just didn't know how good. But, hey, as you said, that run, if he... Could have let him go. Um, probably no doubt he was the winner, but um, I agree with you. Time up the hill. Probably one of the best bred fillies going around. Muscle Hill at a um, majestic time. So they're going to have a lot of fun on the racetrack. And then uh, hopefully the breed continues for them and, and they'll have even more fun uh, in the years to come as they're having now. But that's uh, our four runners that we thought stood out and a few more. Uh, we had a, tipped a few winners, Matty. We started off with a... A good uh, run, a couple of winners at, at Cambridge, Romane and the green keeper. off the top of my head, the Green Keeper. So they were both paid good, four dollars and five fifty or six dollars. Um, went well at Addington. I'm just trying to think off the back of my head. Chuckle, sorry, at Invercargill and Major Punter. They're both nice winners. And then we're going better than the week before because we went four from four uh, or four from five if you count count. Neymar Franco, and then it just started slowly going down, Matty. <laughs> uh, and Addington, both meetings, we didn't have much luck. No, I'll take bragging rights this week. Majestic Labros will improve with that run up for second. Pat's Dragon was actually held up uh, halfway down the straight. I think it would have run probably second or third. I don't think it would have won, but uh, we're finding a wee bit of form. We've probably got to start um, spreading them out over the weekend as opposed to going bang, bang on the first night, and then it's all downhill from there. But uh, yep. At least we found some winners. I suppose that's the bonus in it. If you can keep a 50% record going, well, that's not too bad. Obviously, we want to strive a bit higher, but uh, good value. 
too, Fitzy, and it's probably important to say that too. Look, when when we're sitting down and trying to work out a few horses to throw out at you, it could have been easy for us to throw out horses like Krug and Majestic Man and then get on here tonight and go, wow, we tipped all these winners. You know, the goal is to try and find a bit of value in amongst the mix. And, you know, I thought $6, and I said it last week, was really good money for the greenkeeper. Uh, Todd Mitchell drove him perfect, got him into the race. Thought Chuckles was well over the odds at 480. Uh, Romany was a good bet at the $4 mark or wherever it was. So it's a case of finding horses that are a bit of value and not, you know, your dollar fifty, dollar twenty. Anyone can find those. It's a case of finding those horses that are, we think, are probably more like a dollar twenty chances in their races, but you're getting four or five dollars for them. So we'll continue going down that line, and I don't think there's any favourites in amongst our tips this week, Fitzy. So hopefully we can find a few more winners as well. Although now that I think about it, I think I have got one hot pot going around this week. So we'll touch on that a bit later on. Hopefully we uh, haven't put the Jonah on ourselves and <laughs> we still tip a few winners. But as you say, we're um, looking at fields without knowing the odds. And um, our good mate, Matty Peden, he's probably watching what we're tipping and, and maybe he's dragging it in a few notches uh, from their normal starting price. But that's all right. Rightio, we're joined now by uh, the North Island's leading junior driver, Dylan Ferguson, who is in the race with a number of the South Island juniors for the Premiership and drove two winners the other night at Cambridge. Uh, he joins us and we're just going to talk about what he can expect over the next two or three weeks in that race to the Premiership and then we'll go through his runners uh, and his drives at Cambridge, uh, Auckland, sorry, tomorrow. So Dill's uh, good two winners last week, obviously two that you train yourself, uh, really good runs there, especially Romane. Yeah, no, the, the whole team's been racing really good so uh, it was nice to pick up a couple winners it was a shame I couldn't get one more to level up with Johnny but um, as I say the team's been going real good and we finally sort of got a good draw of Romany and Sunset Red got a great trip so made all the difference and just the um, just the three three drives tomorrow but in the coming weeks leading up to the end of this uh, this month and obviously the season do you expect you've got a few more there that can um, salute the judge and and hopefully get you over the line. Uh, hopefully we got uh, four to take to Pookie Trials on Friday. Uh, a couple of two-year-olds that haven't raced yet. So, um, yeah, we got a couple of tricks up our sleeve. But um, we also need things to go right in the next couple of weeks as well. Any thoughts about um, jumping on the big aeroplane and, and getting down to Canterbury or Invercargill? No, uh, no secret weapons hiding anywhere down here that you might be able to get on? Well, I am actually planning on coming down to Christchurch next week, and um, thankfully it's just for the Junior Drivers' Champs, so um, it should be a good weekend. But it also it could be the telling factor. It's two extra meetings I wouldn't normally get, so fingers crossed they're nice to me and give me a couple of good drives. Nice, uh, nice wee way to slip in there, Dylan, that you're going to be available for drives at Addington next week. Excellent work. Hey, yeah. uh, three drives for you tomorrow night at uh, Alexandra Park. We'll just go through them quickly if we can. Uh, splitting image kicks off your night. Uh, nice, consistent shot of this and looks to be knocking on the... What's the uh, expectation levels like heading into tomorrow? Yeah, she's just a good, honest trotter. Good manners, tries hard. So um, I think she's a good top three chance. Whether she can win, she needs probably the perfect trip. But um, uh, on each way basis and more for the place she's certainly a good chance seems to have good manners that's always a bit of a key in those trotting races um should expect her to do things right throughout yeah no she's um pretty foolproof touch wood she's usually pretty good even with my hands so um yeah i expect her to be one of the first ones away and um she should be right in the finish also from the uh, the Rogi team, or yours and Rogi's team, uh, She Reigns goes around and what's a pretty good trotting field later on in the night. Uh, thoughts there? Yeah, I, was sort of, I thought it was a race in four between the four back markers. Um, she, she's been racing well with, without probably being 100%. Um, I, I thought it, um, a couple of times she could have, you know, just gone that smidge better, but um, she's, her work's been good and she seems well. So uh, with a nice trip, she, she, she's there for sure. You pick up a drive in the junior drivers race, Pembroke Charlie for Tony Cameron. Thought it was actually quite a good run last week. Got left parked and did a bit of work. Uh, 
good good field. Silk's obviously there drawn inside you, but didn't think it was the worst each way chance. Uh, you would have had a chance to look through the form. What did you think? Yeah, no, um, he's been going really good and uh, haven't had much luck um, for Kyle in the junior driver's races yet, but um, whether it be my fault or his, neither of us want to own up to it that often, but um, he, he has a tricky draw, but hopefully a uh, hot early tempo will play into our hands, so fingers crossed they decide to have a crack at leaving Silk out this week and see if they can beat it. Apologies to Kyle Marshall, who of course trains Pembroke Charlie. I don't know why I thought it was Tony Cameron. He usually is sitting on the bike from memory. Dylan, a question for you. Junior Drivers Premiership is obviously really starting to hot up. There's only a couple of wins between the top three of years with Ben Hope making some big moves and Johnny Morrison picking up a winner next week. Take yourself out of the race for a minute. Who do you think's in the best position to go forward and win it? Uh, I think on numbers, Johnny, and on stable firepower, Ben. So just depends who's going to come to the fore with either of those two of course, things, I think. Of course, when you come down here when, uh, next week and win every race in the Junior Drivers' Championship, we won't even need to have this discussion, will we? Well, that's the plan. Uh, I was actually talking about it with Johnny the other night, and he said he normally gets the crap drives, so fingers <laughs> crossed. So they don't go with him and give him the, the good ones. And while, you, while we've got you there, uh, Dills, this is your last season of being a junior driver. 115 wins so far as a junior. Your best season to date, uh, 29 so far again this, this season. Uh, what stands out for you over your time as a junior driver? Obviously, you've had a couple of trips overseas and um, what's what's a couple of things that stand out in your memory as, as enjoyable and, and your best moments? I've never had a bad one yet, but um, obviously, see, uh, driving a winner at Redcliffe was really good and getting to drive at Albion Park as well um so yeah getting those sort of opportunities that most people never get to go to triple a but as i say everyone has been good i've been very lucky with the trainers and owners that have supported me over my um junior years and hopefully working into a senior driver um they those opportunities keep coming Brilliant. Uh, and we wish you the best of luck and, and we'll see you down here next week and hopefully you punch a couple uh, punch a couple home and, and can keep right on the toes of those boys and uh, make them sweat a bit. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, guys. Hopefully we keep it interesting. Hey, uh, last week we said this week we're going to touch on a few marketing things and just a few um, content-related things. Uh, we'll kick off, Matty, with race fields and, and being in the paper and obviously uh, working for The Guardian and Ashford and you're right up to the play on this, so you'll be able to chat to us a bit more about this. Yeah, look, it's an interesting situation, Fitzy. Look, um, I've, I've seen it from both, uh, obviously, the, the Christchurch Press side of things and also um, where I am at the moment, Ashford and Guardian, so a small fish, very big fish type situation. Look, uh, the big mastheads, the TOBs actually paid those papers to run racing fields for, for the last wee while. Um, I'm talking probably 10 years or so. Uh, and then you've got a paper like ours, a small independent owned. We've actually paid someone to produce the race fields for us. Uh, so it's been a bit of a, an imbalance. And yet here we are, you know, six weeks after the decision was made to ask them. I haven't seen a race field in the Christchurch Press. The Ashburton Guardian still running race fields every day at our cost because we see a value in it to our readers and if we can't make an organisation like Rita see the value in having race fields and papers and paying for that, then we're in big trouble because while we'd like to think that everyone's on Facebook and, you know, TAB apps and things like that, the, the cold hard reality is that they're not. Um, a huge portion of our population rely on those racing fields and papers and publications to give them their information that they need for the weekend ahead. Oh, a perfect example this week, I had a phone call from a 92-year-old man from Oxford. 
Um, so that's about an hour and a half away from our office, the Ashburton Guardian. He wanted to know if we could deliver by courier the Guardian to him every day so that he had the racing fields at, at his desk when he sat down every day to watch races. Unfortunately, it wasn't tenable for us, but uh, I've managed to put him in touch with the race form team. So hopefully he gets his racing fields for at least the latter part of the week that way. But, you know, it's it's frustrating from someone who works in the newspaper industry to see that and you know to see how easily it was disregarded it's pretty disappointing and i know that there are a lot of people out there that are missing them um and i think it probably just goes to show how well read they were in racing uh and sorry in newspapers so hopefully we can get to a point where we bring them back i've got to make some decisions at the guardian and soon whether we carry on continue paying for them I think what will end up happening is we'll have to justify it by running just Canterbury racing fields across all three codes, and that'll be as much as we can do. But I know the NZ Herald and the ODT are, are still going ahead with them, which is fantastic. Well done to them. Um, but there's a bit of an imbalance there, and if it's going to be provided for one, it should be provided for all. So hopefully we can get that rectified in the uh, in the coming days or weeks. Yeah, just one of those um, pretty quick cost-cutting uh, measures that they brought in and another one was race presenters uh, like we spoke about last week we've lost Greg O'Connor, uh, Mick Gurren and Craig Whale thompson who effectively for Harness Racing are our three biggest um, three biggest presenters and, and drag in a lot of um, a lot of income especially Mick Gurren with with his work over Australasia and between all the papers and a lot of media stuff he does, he draws a lot of attention to um, New Zealand harness racing and New Zealand racing as a, as a whole. Um, obviously, the news yesterday, Greg O'Connor is the new racing industry manager at Eddington Raceway. So that's great that we've been able to keep him in a role uh, within Canterbury and within harness racing. We haven't lost him completely, but really it is a shame to see him lost as a presenter uh, and, and driving turnover, no doubt he'll have some ideas with Addington and looking forward to seeing what he does there um, along the way of Addington driving their own turnover and, and marketing their racing product, but it's a shame not to have him uh, involved at the top level. Yeah, it is. Look, um, you can look at this whole thing collectively, whether it's fields and newspapers, presenters, radio trackside, whatever it's it's almost like when we've sat down to do this cost cutting exercise we've gone with a bit of arrogance oh we don't need to promote our sport because people are going to tune in and watch and they're going to be no matter what well the cold hard fact is that's not the case you know you mentioned you know your, your craig uh craig thompson's your mix your greg's you know oh, even a guy like davy mack i know people down in southland that will just hang off his every word they'll back horses that he would tip that are paying $32 because Davey saw it go good at the trials, you know, that's classic Davey stuff. The personalities are what sells the product, not the product itself. And that's the problem we've got here. And this is with the greatest of respect to the existing members of the broadcasting team with Trackside. But you take away those key ingredients and all of a sudden your product's diminished. Um, you know, Greg, Mick, Craig, the amount of work that goes into what they do before a race meeting is quite remarkable and a lot of people would never have been able to see that work i've been lucky i've seen the amount of work that they do and the knowledge that they bring when they first come to camera the pr preparation that they've done behind the scenes to get to that point is quite incredible so look we need to get to a point where particularly for harness racing because i think what we're going to find in the new season is that some of our biggest race days are going to be severely lacking in coverage from what we've had in the past. There's no, there's no hidden fact about that, you know. And we need to make sure that we've got the content flowing to keep people coming through the gate, or even if they're sitting at home on Cup Day having a bet, you know, it's it's got to be fixed and it's got to be fixed quickly. Uh, promotion is the biggest thing that we can do. Just throwing some information up on a Facebook page and saying there's races at Addington tonight, not enough anymore. You know, you need to be doing it right from the grassroots level right up to the top. So. Uh, there's been some bad decisions made and I would like to think that at some point they will be rectified and some of these positions that we've seen gone are reinstated in time and, you know, we get some of these personalities that people know and trust back on our screens. Yeah, you make a really good point um, that I'm just going to touch on about how people back the personality, as you say, like Davy Mack, if he's tipping one out that he liked the trials. Um, and I was always big on that and obviously like the work that you did with the shark, I would have rather stuff like that have been that with your name and all that shark stuff, you know, it was done by multiple people. And 
multiple good tipsters. But how does someone know when you see a mystery tipper um, tipping or or a, or a name like that? How do you know who it is? And and how do you back it with confidence? I always compare it to like the work and boys get paid. You know, if every tip that got posted in the boys get paid group of seventeen thousand people, if it just came through as boys get paid and you couldn't put a name to the to the tip or a face to the tip, then you wouldn't back it with as much confidence. There's people on there, especially like in harness. Uh, if you tip one or Troy Scanlon or any of those boys, they tip one. We, everyone knows they're having a good run. Uh, Andrew Lacey and the Gallops, if he tips one, instead of putting five each way on it because it's just a tip, they'll go, no, no, no. Oh, you know, I backed one he tipped last week and it won. So this week I'll put $20 on it. You know, so it's extra turnover. And as you say, it's backing the personality. So I'd like to see a lot more like that brought back, created um, and go away from the hiding who's actually providing you the information because you want to be trusting that information when you're spending your hard cold cash yeah you're right look um the shark days i think i made it pretty clear from the outset that i probably didn't agree with the moniker um but at the end of the day it was the the marketing path that they wanted to go there was some merit in it but not to the extent that it went to for me i think you know um a shark coming up and tipping one at one meeting at one at each meeting was enough you know instead we were trying to do every race at every race meeting across the country and i'm the sort of person that would rather focus on four or five and i know i've probably belittled that a wee bit on twitter over the past few weeks tipping one in every race but it's it's a case of you know often quality over quantity is a lot better and it makes it easier to be a little bit more accountable for your results you're right about big uh, BGP. Um, I've tipped a horse on there at thirty-two dollars, and it's closed at six. You know, those boys can and girls, sorry, they can get involved in one and drop a price. And uh, remember, Steve Richardson messaging me one day, going, uh, "I can't say it live on here, but we'd uh, we'd got one home, sixteens into fives, I think. It was a horse called Nova Time at Forbury Park, uh, and the boys cleaned up. So there's a bit of power there, and it, uh, you're right, it is personality. Um, I haven't tipped a winner on there for probably a year. Um, everything I tip on there seems to go pear shaped, so I stay off there as much as I can unless I really like one. But the personalities, and Troy Scanlon's a perfect example. Um, he's got an incredible strike rate, probably better than anyone else on that page. Um, we should actually get him on here for a chat one night. Good West, West Coast man, I think he'd be great fun. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, personality is a key. Um, on Grego, I think it's great that the industry hasn't lost him. Uh, that's a new role that Addington have created, and look, I think uh, he will tackle that uh, front on. Bit of a homecoming for him, 94 to 2000, I think he was there, so he's uh, he's back. Um, and he'll bring in some new initiatives and make some changes and, and look to ramp up their uh, content. There are improving signs in the industry, Fitz, you know, the work you're doing, you know, with Often Racing and the stable work that you're doing. We're seeing more and more stables come on board, you know. Anna Donnelly, the Stonewall Stud team, um, Johnny Cox and Kim Butt doing their little um, on the road again segment each time they go to the race meeting. Um, and then, of course, you know, Kirsten and Tank do a good job down in Southland as well. So the content level is lifting, and it's great that those people have taken that responsibility on their shoulders from their own stables. But technically, it shouldn't be their responsibility, you know, it should be the industry's responsibility to spruik what's coming up. Uh, and using that skill, you know, we are critical of the HRNZ marketing team, but you know they they do a good job with what they've got. Uh, there's no hiding from that. I've worked in that office. Um, it's it's not easy uh, being the governing body. You can't. You've got to be really careful on what you are sharing. Courtney's doing a good job. Her videos have been really good. I've enjoyed her interviews. You know, and adding to the same. You know, the videos that are coming out there, Jess's stuff during the week, and then uh, Stacey's little sister stuff on Friday nights and things like that. I found that enjoyable. You know. Um, and particularly Nigel. Um, Nigel copped a bit of criticism on Facebook this week and it just boggled my mind. Um, the guy's there doing it for free and he's adding a different colour and a different aspect to the content that's coming out post-race and it's enjoyable stuff uh, done in a humour in which only Nigel could do which makes it as uh, enjoyable as what it is. So look there's content lifting I think we're on the right track but it would be nice if the uh, the big body and I talk about Rita here made some decisions that help the promotion of the game a hell of a lot easier. Yeah, and I think um, I agree with you. There's a lot of content coming out, and it'd be really good to group that onto uh, one under one brand or onto one website, and then uh, market that website out into the 
wider world because a lot of the stuff that gets done just uh, stays in the harness racing or the racing circle and doesn't really um, you know break that barrier and get out into the world uh, we've got to understand that normal people going by their day-to-day -day life uh, aren't stressed about harness racing they don't go to the hrmz website they don't go to harness racing unhinged unless it's you know that like that like crusaders video the other day got really good views ten thousand. that's the sort of stuff that gets out into it and breaks that bubble but just like generalized racing stuff it doesn't uh doesn't showcase and get out into the wider public so somehow we need to be able to grab all that um content put it towards somewhere and and do it all as one and, and get out into the big bad world and um, promote this good sport you know and I think it's all getting better as we say but I think there's a long way to go and, and hopefully we're on the right foot. Yeah I think you're right look um, one thing that I always thought that we should do that we we don't do is use some of the big names we've got in the sport you know we've got guys like Brendan McCullum, Steve Hansen, you know Harness Racing, Kieran Reid, Andy Ellis involved in the Woodlands I'll be using those guys and going and tapping them on the shoulder. I'm sure they'd be happy to do it. You know, getting them on a bit of mainstream television on a on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night, you know, I've got horses racing at Rickett in this week. You could come and join me, you know, and then promo it that way. Um, people relate, and I use sporting people because that's what people seem to relate to, you know. If Brenda McCallum tells me to do something, I'd better be doing it. So that's why I think we need to use those guys as marketing tools a lot better than what we are at the moment. So, yeah, I mean... We could talk about marketing all night, but uh, we need to see some change. Um, the industry itself is trying to change it, but we need some support from those higher up. So hopefully we can get that uh, at some point in the near future. Yep, promote the people as well and, and promote the horses. Um, everyone says we need a good horse that we can promote, Promote, sorry, but we had uh, Lazarus and, in my opinion, we failed to uh, promote him as we should have. And he could have been that Winx type horse for harness racing. So, um, hey, enough about marketing. As you said, we could keep going on about it, but we've got some winners to tip and we've got some race meetings to talk about. So, we're going to go tomorrow, Auckland, and uh, I'll start off, Maddie, race seven, number five, Kerry Maguire from the Telfer Barn, Ben Butcher and the Bike. Just think it gets into a really nice race. It's drawn a bit wide, but. Um, I think she'll play a major part in that race. And you headed to race five, uh, number five again, Captain Nemo, one of Ray Green's. Yeah, I thought its run last week behind Prince of Pleasure was good, um, but surprised at the price. It's opened up around the $5 mark. Well, it's stable, mate. Franco Nandor, who it beat home last week, uh, is $1.80. eighty. do not think there's that much discrepancy between the two of them. Um, I'd expect Zach Butcher to push forward early, potentially look to find the markers. And if Get to the front i thought it was a good chance so race five number five captain nemo for me in Chicago, we head to on thursday uh, we managed to find a couple of winners down there last week hopefully we can do the same again this week but i'm going to go race two number two the red robber blair orange jumps on the bike it was in a really really good field last week and i thought it went really well for third so from a good draw and what is a very even field i thought it was a nice good bet early on in the day what did you find for us down there Yep, I've gone uh, race seven, Zambia, uh, Paul Kerr runner, Johnny Morris on the bike, lock wheels last week at Addington, never got a go at them, and um, by all reports, had been working very well before that, so um, gives Johnny Morrison a chance to put another winner on the board for the junior premiership race, uh, so I think he's drawn a bit wide as well, but it's a maiden field, and it's a drop back on what he's been racing, so he should be uh, a player in that race and pretty hard to beat race oops, sorry we go to Eddington on Friday night again as is the usual and um, I'll start off race two number two mighty reactor finally gets a good draw uh, he's been going really well obviously driven by Kimberly Butt and trained by Brad Mowbray um, good draw just think it's an even maiden field it's not a star maiden field but they're all the same ability and he gets a good draw he's not going to have to do as much work as last time He'll settle uh, handy over the 1980 and, and should be a good chance there. And you've uh, gone for a very unlucky runner last week. Yeah, race eight, number nine, Tango Tara for me this week. I've tipped him before. Look, I, after what we said about Spirit of St. Louis earlier in the night, I think half a gap at the 200 metre mark and uh, Tango Tara might have beaten him. Um, big performance. 
Um, good thing for me this week is off a handicap, uh, isn't going to get caught back on the fence, is capable of doing a bit of work. We know that from the uh, the Cup Day win. So I thought it was a good bet this week. Race 8, number 9, Tango Tara. We're back to Addington again on Sunday for another Sunday afternoon harness meet there. I went to race 4, number 11, Johnny Morrison for me with uh, Harrison. It is. Uh, goes around in the fourth. Was a very good third on debut. Big booming type. Gee, looks like he's going to develop into himself nicely. Uh, I just thought that if he got a bit more clear air and was able to roll probably from the 800 metre mark, he could be uh, pretty hard to catch. So race four, number 11, Harrison for me on Sunday. What do you find for us there, Andrew? Yeah, I've gone for a uh, quick sport race one. I've tipped him before uh, a couple of times, I think, and he was involved in that locking of the wheels with Zambia. So uh, I think that form is going to stack up, I thought last week on, on Sunday that those two were going to be the ones to fight it out and in the end they started fighting each other and lock wheels and <laughs> ruined their chances but he gets into a race that really on his run uh, two starts ago where he never got to go at them down the straight he should be winning it it's not a good field and um, he's been knocking on the door and with any type of luck he'll record a win and uh, if he doesn't then I'll never tip him again because he's had his fair few chances but uh yeah, no, I think he's a good chance, and I don't know what, he'll probably be favourite, but I think uh, he's the best one in that field. So hopefully we've tipped a few more there, Matty, and uh, can keep the role going, and hopefully we can tip one at every meeting this week and not just go early and uh, not tip any later on. Yeah, absolutely. Eight winners would be nice this week instead of uh, four or five or whatever it was last week. We won't put too much pressure on ourselves. Uh, hopefully we can find a winner out there and hopefully someone can make a dollar from it. So look, uh, that's probably another show for another week. Uh, we've covered a fair bit of territory. Thanks to uh, Dylan Ferguson for coming on. It'd be nice to get a few more of those interviews rolling. I reckon we're scanning someone that will uh, have to hit up and tap on the shoulder. Uh, until next week, Fitzy, um, I'm running low on the jacket department. Uh, Harnessed dress this week. Uh, Garrick Knight will be wrapped with that. I've got one more jacket left, and it's a Highlanders jacket, and I'm not uh, going to wear it until they win their next match. So uh, looking for some merch, if anyone's got some out there. Nice way to get your business or something branded on uh, on the show, which is getting about 7,500 clicks on average per week. So uh, hit me up. I'm looking for some new clothes. So uh, until next week, toodaloo to you, and hopefully everyone has a good harness racing week and uh, makes a bit of money and enjoys what's on offer. Yep, I'm just uh, sponsored by myself, but uh, as you say, any merchandise dealers out there, Carter Delgetti, I'm looking at you, Fuego Collection. Uh, we'll happily take a couple of jackets and sponsor that, but as again, yep, thanks for joining me, Maddie, and uh, we've tipped a few winners, hopefully, and see you again next week, and we'll do it all again.